Hello, everyone, and welcome to this HEC Paris virtual conference room for our HEC Insights webinar series. When joining the conference, you will notice that your microphones have been switched off. You will, however, be able to ask questions and make comments using the Q&A menu that you will find at the bottom of your window in the Zoom toolbar. The professor will only answer questions and read comments sent through the Q&A menu and will not be taking any questions or comments coming from the chat. Please be aware that questions in the Q&A menu can be upvoted by clicking on the thumbs up icon and thus prioritized on the professor's dashboard. Make sure that you keep the chat for technical questions to our team only. We also would like to remind you that the webinar is broadcasted live on YouTube. We'll now begin and I'll leave the floor to Anne Michaud who is uh, Associate uh, Dean for uh, Pedagogy at HEC. Anne? Thank you, Adrien. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome, and thank you very much for being with us today. I'm Amy Shaw, Associate Dean for Pedagogy at HEC Paris, and I'm very happy to introduce this webinar. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome my colleague Georges Bernicke, Assistant Professor at HEC Paris, to talk about CEO activism, the topic of his current research. Georges' expertise is on the intersection of corporate governance with corporate social responsibility, these clearly are themes of growing interest in a diversity of sectors, likely even more during this pandemic. So Georges, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to speak in this webinar. A warm welcome to you and uh, the floor is yours. So, thanks very much Anne, for, the, for the kind introduction and thanks very much everybody for being here. Uh, I know it's lunchtime for many of you, uh, for others it's the morning, for other sources in Asia, it might be the evening here. So I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with me about what I think is one of the most exciting topics one can do research on uh, in, in current times. That is CEO activism. So CEO activism uh, is part of my research uh, uh, program here. We have just started a larger research program on the topic, on the issue, with colleagues from HSA Paris, but also with colleagues from other universities all around the world. So what do I want to do uh, with you in the next 35 to 40 minutes? I want to cover, I want to cover four things. First, I would like to define and speak with you about what is CEO activism and what is not CEO activism, who engages in CEO activism, and what are the topics CEO speak out about. Then I would like to cover with you and understand a little bit better what are the drivers, the antecedents of, of CEO activism. Why do some CEOs speak out? on social political issues and why do others not speak out? And the third point I would like to cover with you, what we know, and that's, you know, just to foreshadow it a little bit, it's rather little. What do we know about the impact of CEO activism on important stakeholder groups, such as employees, customers, or on the share price? And finally, in the fourth part, I would like to provide you with some advice on whether or not and when and how and if to engage in CEO activism. So that might be valuable to you if you're a manager and thinking about publicly weighing in on a social political issue, or it might be valuable to you if you're a board member and you need to advise a CEO or a manager whether or not to engage in CEO activism. But let's dive right in with the first question. What is CEO activism? So CEO activism is a business leader publicly taking a personal stance on a salient social or political issue. And notice here, right, that I speak about business leaders. So it's not confined to the CEO, but it could be well other top managers or members of the board of directors or founders of companies. But those business leaders take publicly take a stance on a current issue that is heavily discussed within a society. This issue might be related to social uh, issues or to political issues. Now, let me give you a few examples of CEOs who have engaged in CEO activism. From the US, we have Rose Macario, the CEO of Patagonia, Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan, Kenneth Fraser from Merck, Tim Cook from Apple, or Howard Schultz, the former CEO of Starbucks. Now, what we can see across the world is that CEO activism is a bit more prevalent uh, as, as a phenomenon in the US, but it's currently, or it's since a few years, it's actually starting to spread around the world as well. So let me give you a few examples from other parts of the world. In Asia, James Liang has spoken out, it's the CEO of Citra. And Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, has been very, very vocal on some social and political issues. In Europe, uh, we have the founder of uh, Dyson, James Dyson, who has spoken out a lot on the issue of Brexit. We have the two HEC Paris alumni, uh, François-Henri Pinot, the CEO of Caring, and Emmanuel Faber, Danone. They have spoken out on the sustainability of the fashion industry and the food industry. We have the former CEO of the British-Dutch uh, uh, conglomerate Unilever, 
We have the CEO of the German industrial conglomerate Siemens, Joe Kayser, speaking out, and Moya Green, the former CEO of Royal Green. So what you can see here is that across a variety of industries and across a variety of topics, CEOs have spoken out in a personally way. Now, what are the topics those CEOs have spoken on? It's a great variety here. So I've created some kind of like, you know, salad here of the different topics they've touched upon. So they've spoken out on issues related to race, ethnicity, democracy, specific aspects of democracy or democracy in general, capitalism, but also LGBT rights, gender equality and inequality, abortion, uh, tariffs, uh, travel bans, immigration policy, uh, Black Lives Matter, just, and just recently, of course, on the election in the US. So what you can see here is that those CEOs come from a variety of companies, from a variety of industries, from a variety of countries, and they've spoken out on a big variety, you know, a large variety of topics. Now let's try to bring in some, some order uh, in, the, in this you know, overview of, of CEOs speaking out. Is it that every CEO speaks out and every CEO speaks out on, on similar topics, on, on all topics? This is actually not the case. So what I'm going to show you here is now uh, information from a survey done by the Stanford University in 2018 on CEO activism. And what they have done is they've looked over almost 10 years from 2010 to 2018, they looked at instances of CEO activism among the CEOs of the S&P 1500 companies. Now, first we're gonna have a look at the CEOs from the S&P 500 companies. You could say these are the largest companies in the world, okay? Among those CEOs, among those who have been CEO during that time period, roughly 28% or 138 of them have spoken out on social political issues. 10% of the 500 CEOs have spoken out personally. So what you can see here is, it's not that every CEO speaks out all the time. You know, it's, it's rather roughly a quarter of CEOs who speak out and those who speak out very often speak out on multiple topics. And the second fact we can see from the survey is that it's very often not super clear if the CEO speaks on his or her personal behalf or also on the behalf of the company. So it's very, very blurry sometimes of CEO activism that's publicly weighing in on, on the current social or political issue is just on behalf of the CEO or on behalf of the company or on behalf of both. Now, when we look at the breakdown of issues here, we see that CEOs predominantly speak out about issues related to the environment or diversity, 44 to 57%. And remember, CEOs can speak out about multiple topics, right? And less so about immigration, human rights, or politics, right? So it's not every CEO who speaks out, and it's predominantly the engagement CEO activism is predominantly concentrated in environmental and diversity issues. Now let's expand that survey to the S&P 1500 firms. So it includes the S&P 500, but it is an additional 1,000 firms. We're a bit smaller than the S&P 500 firms. So what we can see here is that, of course, the absolute numbers of CEO increases. We're not looking at a sample of 500 CEOs, but a sample of 1,500 CEOs. But relatively, the sample time, the sample of CEOs or the number of CEOs speaking out decreases. So it seems as that CEO activism is a bit more concentrated across CEOs of larger companies, right? Remember, this is just data from the US. Unfortunately, there's very, very little data and research being done on Europe or Asia. And this is something we're currently working on. So most of the information and the, the studies and the research I'm gonna introduce you to is gonna be based on US data. But again, the US is also the country where CEO activism has been the most prevalent in recent years. So takeaway from here is not, everybody's, not every CEO speaks out, not every CEO speaks out on every topic. It's rather roughly a quarter of CEOs and it's, and the topics I speak out is more concentrated on environmental and diversity, diversity issues. Now, I wanna bring some order in different types of activism. And I wanna bring the order in by building on work by Braniki, which was just published in this year, a few months ago in the Journal of Business Ethics. So Braniki and colleagues here. And what they have done is they have built a two by two matrix um, and re divided um, activism into four quarters depending on whether or not the issue this business leaders speak out on is strongly related to the core of the business or the company, or is only weakly related or has no relation with the company, the business of the company. And in the second dimension they have divided, divided CEO activism into is whether or not the issue is very intense or one could say salient. 
So a very intense issue is an issue which is currently hotly debated within a society and where usually opinions are split, right? It doesn't have to be 50-50, but maybe it's 50-50, it's 60-40, 70-30, something like this. And usually there's very strong opinions on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I think the US election is, is a good example of what's currently happening, right? Questioning whether or not, uh, um, you know, votes have been, mail-in ballots have been legal or not. This is an example of a hotly debated issue. Right? So an issue can be, you know, hotly debated, so it's really current in the mind of, of the people, or it's rather weekly. So then the, the issues that are rather, you know, have very low intensity are issues where society has somehow either lost interest in or somehow agreed on what a possible solution is. Okay, let's use that framework to bring some order into the different activities or different types of activism to understand a little bit better how we can differentiate different types uh, um, from one another. So the first type of activism, uh, the authors call token activism. And token activism is characterized by having very low business relatedness and rather low issue intensity. So that's, that's an issue not very much related to the core of the business. And it's not an issue where society is currently, you know, having big, uh, hotly, uh, hot discussions about. It. So let me give you an example. Uh, here is one of the Civic Alliance. Uh, this is a, a not-for-profit organization in the US which had called CEOs of various companies in the US to sign the following statement, namely that they call for safe access to the polls for all water, for all voters, that they recognize state and local election officials as a trusted source for certified results, and that they encourage patients as officials count every vote. Now, I've picked that example, of course, right before the election, it became a bit more prevalent that maybe that issue is a bit more discussed than I actually thought in the beginning, but basically, what this not-for-profit not for organization calls for is simply that there's, you know, there's going to be an election that we trust those who run the election and that we should wait a little until the votes are counted, right? And this statement has been signed by over a thousand CEOs of large companies from the US, but also international companies which are active in the US, right? So this issue is, is rather weak relation, at least in immediate uh, circumstances or time with the business of those companies. Right? And it's an issue where probably across different political ideologies, almost everyone can agree on, at least that you know, there should be fair elections and everybody should have the right to vote. Let's go on to the second uh, category of CEO activism, that's so-called strategic activism. What is strategic activism? You would like to use the example of Emmanuel Faber, the CEO of Danone, who has spoken out a lot on the sustainability of the food industry. He has said things as, we have broken the cycle of life he has said, we need your support for shifting agriculture subsidies from killing life into supporting biodiversity. So clearly the food industry is absolutely central to the business of the norm. So he has a high business relatedness, but it's probably not as much as contentious or disputed whether or not we need to change the food industries, or at least we need to have a stronger focus on, on biodiversity and sustainability in the, in the food industry. So it's an issue which is not intensely debated, but which is core to the, to the business of Danone, right? Other examples, you know, uh, Emmanuel Faber has spoken out on the purpose of businesses, saying that companies should have a purpose, at least Danone should have a purpose beyond just generating returns to shareholders. And in an interview with The Economist, he has actually questioned capitalism. Right? So again, it doesn't have a direct impact on, I mean, so it, it is not an issue which is currently hotly debated in. Right? but which is purpose of the company and the sustainability of the food industry, which is absolutely central, of course, to the business of Denmark. Now let's move on to the third category, servant activism. Servant activism is characterized by low relevance to the core of the business, at least in the immediate future, but is characterized by high issue salience or intensity. But this is an issue which is currently hotly debated here. Let me give you an example. Uh, Tim Cook, uh, the CEO of Apple, tweeting out uh, tweets, basically congratulating the passing of laws which allow same-sex couples to get married. He did the same for uh, countries, other countries, such as Australia, right? So whether or not uh, people, you know, same-sex genders can get married or not has very little or rather weak direct relation to the core of Apple. But it's an issue which has been heavily discussed in many countries around the world, especially in the US and here also in Australia. 
Uh, Tim Cook had also spoken out against uh, religious freedom laws, which in his opinion have could be used to discriminate against LGBT. Yeah? Again, these laws have rather weak direct connection to the core business of Apple, but they're heavily debated in the US. The uh, religious freedom laws are actually with a split population with 50%, 50% something around there, pro such laws or 50% of the population against such laws. And then finally, we have the fourth uh, sector here. This is so-called citizen uh, activism. And citizen activism is characterized by having high issue intensity and high business relevance. So this is, for example, companies from the Silicon Valley in the US speaking out against the immigration policy of the last, um, of the last presidency or still presidency of, of Donald Trump here on the basis of saying, well, I mean, on the basis of saying this is relevant to their businesses because not only will most of these businesses, many of those businesses founded by immigrants, but they also rely on immigration of high skilled labor immigration uh, in their workforce. Uh, and it's an issue which has been, you know, highly disputed and intensively discussed during the presidency of Donald Trump. Right? Okay, a similar example here from the UK, uh, James Dyson has spoken out uh, about the Brexit quite a lot. The Brexit clearly has a, has, a, has a relation to the core of the business of Dyson here. It, it has a relationship to trade relations, open trades, trade terrorists, trade barriers, but it's also an issue which has moved, uh, emotionally moved large parts of the British population. And I, would, you know, I think it's fair to say all of the European population. So these are the four brackets we have, the four types of, of CO activism, citizen activism, uh, activism, strategic activism, token activism, and so on. Of course, there's going to be more. I mean, you know, it's not a four by four matrix is not going to do justice to the different types. And of course, the examples I've just given you don't squarely fit in one of the, the brackets, right? So there's, you know, we can dispute each of the um, examples. Here. But hopefully I've given you some grasp of what different types of activism now, I would like to do a little survey with you uh, and a poll here, and I would like to ask you the following question and hear your opinion on it. In general, should the CEO of large companies use their position uh, to advocate for, um, on behalf of social, environmental, or political issues that they care about personally? So in general, do you think that CEOs of large companies use their position and their potential to advocate on behalf of social, environmental, and political issues that they care about personally. Do you agree with that statement? Do you disagree? Or do you not have an opinion? For those who are following on YouTube, please note that you can't see the survey, unfortunately. So in general, do you think that CEOs of large companies should speak out on social political issues that they care about personally or not? Or do you have no opinion? Uh, the 83% uh, bar, so I suggest that we end the polling and we'll share the result, okay? Absolutely. All right. Okay, wow. So that's 78% of you agree that CEOs should speak out on social political issues. 17% of you disagree and 6% of you have no opinion. Okay, that's very interesting. That's, that seems, let's put that in comparison, right? So, I mean, I'm gonna make the case that CEO activism is a you know, disputed activity, is an activity where opinions divert. Um, but let's look at, let's put that into perspective and let's see what other countries have said about it. So I'm gonna show you um, information from a survey that has been done again from Stanford University in 2018. And this survey shows that 65% of the participants here, and the participants were roughly three and a half thousand uh, respondents, 65% agree that CEOs should speak out on those issues. They care about personally, 35% disagree. So that is less than we have found here. But that's interesting. It could signal that and we likely have more an, uh, European audience here, that the European audience is more in favor of CEOs speaking out on those issues than it is, for example, in the US. Now, also what is interesting here is if you split the opinion among the political affiliation, and again, we are in the political spectrum of the US. So Democrats are way more in favor of CEOs speaking out than they are Republicans. 
Similar effects when we look at different age ranges. So we see the younger the respondents are, so especially millennials, millennials are those who are younger than 38 years, are predominantly two thirds, more than two thirds of them are in favor of CEO activism. Whereas uh, among the uh, generation X and the baby boomers, it's 63 to 46%. So the older the respondents are, the less likely they are favoring CEO activism on topics the CEO care about personally. Right? Now, let's look at the opinions on CEO activism where the CEO speaks on behalf of the business or on behalf of employees, for example. And here the values change and become more similar to the values, uh, to, the, to the results we have. So here 72% of respondents say, yes, we support CEO activism. If the CEO speaks out on its current social political issue on behalf of the business or employees, right? And this is now across political affiliations here. So uh, it's always a majority, whether or not it's democratic or Republican respondent and across all age ranges. Still younger respondents, prefer CEO activism on behalf of the businesses or employees more than older generations, but all of them in the majority agree that activism on those issues is good. Well, that's very interesting here. And it seems there might be some difference between Europe uh, and the US. Now also what I wanna show you here is, is another graph from that survey here, which basically splits up this to the favorability of CEO activism among the respondents based on the topic the CEO speak on. So the, re the red dots you see here is the net favorability. So it's basically the number of respondents to favor the CEO speak out on the issue minus the number of respondents who do not favor the CEO to speak out on an issue. And what we can clearly see here that there are issues where the majority of respondents think CEO activism is well taken as a favor of CEO activism. So that is clean air and water, renewable energy, healthcare, sustainability. Whereas we have a few issues where the opinion is a bit more split and it starts with racial issues, immigration or LGBT rights. And for some issues such as abortion rights, politics in general, or religious issues or issues related to religion, there's a majority of respondents who think that CEOs should not speak out on those issues, right? So what we can see and what the takeaway from those surveys is that if you're a bit more liberal leaning, you're probably more likely going to be in favor of CEO activism. If you're younger, you're probably going to be more likely in favor of CEO activism. In general, there's more favorability on CEO activism if CEOs speak out on behalf of employees, on behalf of consumers, or on behalf of the business. Uh, certain topics, it seems a majority of the population does not appreciate the CEOs to take a public stance, especially issues related to religion or politics. Now, this brings us to a topic which is something I'm currently working on with, with another colleague from uh, Toulouse, where we ask the question whether or not CEO activism is legitimate, right? So is it legitimate democratically that CEOs who have a lot of power, who sometimes run companies that have revenues that exceed uh, the, the income or the budget of some countries, interfere in the political will formation process by speaking out publicly? This is an issue the legitimacy of CEO activism, which is very often in most of the papers just peripherally acknowledged or sometimes brushed under the curtain, right? So there's some good arguments to say that CEO activism potentially is, is hurting democracy here. So one argument is that CEOs are not democratically elected compared to union leaders, for example, or um, leaders of political parties. Um, there's some politicians who have said, this is big business CEOs coming in who use economic threats to exercise more power over public policy than the voters have in the democratic process here. Uh, some others, the former governor of Louisiana called it bullying, uh, CEO activism. Now, criticism is also whether, you know, that it's pretty unclear whether or not the CEO speaks on a personal behalf, on a personal matter, or on behalf of the company. And there's those uh, who say that CEOs are not hired to interfere in social political debates, but they're actually hired to run a company and to run a company well. On the other side are those who support CEO activism um, and say, no, I mean, this, this is the most responsible thing you can actually do. Use the power and influence and the prominence you have to speak up, to interfere, to provide information and in the democratic will formation uh, process, to give voice to those who maybe don't have the power or the prominence to have their voice heard, heard right? Uh, some CEOs say that you know it's not a choice; it's part of your job today as a CEO. Um, you might want to, you might be pushed into taking a stance by employees, by customer, or by society. So, 
being apolitical is sometimes not an issue. And if you don't take a stand, that might be actually viewed as taking a stand. So this is, of course, this is of course a topic on an issue which is you know, currently heavily debated. Uh, there's no right or wrong here, but there's different viewpoints. And I would you know, I would come back to that, but I would like to stress that a little bit that of course it can be questioned whether or not it's good for democracy that CEOs of such large and powerful companies engage so heavily and so strongly in the democratic world formation process. Okay, let me jump to the drivers, to the second part of this presentation here. Let's talk about the drivers of CEO activism. And I have to say, quite frankly, we don't know that much about it, at least empirically not. We have some speculation about what drives CEOs to speak out. Right? So the literature here, and this is a lot of work being done currently around the world here by different teams, um, suggests different drivers of CEO activism. And I put them into four different buckets. There's probably going to be more buckets, but I thought those four characterize the different drivers quite well. The first bucket are strategic business reasons. So here, business leaders engage in activism because they think it's going to have a positive effect on their brand value. It's going to have a positive effect on their sales, so more people will appreciate the products and buy the products. It might have a positive effect on employees, so employees might be more motivated to work for the company. They might stay longer. Uh, they might be less likely to leave the company or future um, potential employees might be more willing to apply to a company if the CEO engages in CEO activism, the CEO of the company engages in CEO activism. Or simply it might help the company to achieve a better competitive position. The second bucket of drivers of CEO activism is what I call strategic personal strategic reasons. So this could be that the CEO wants to build a brand uh, of himself or Maybe the CEO also wants to get some attention. So there's quite a strong stream of literature of research in there which shows that certain characteristics of CEOs, such as narcissism, uh, leads to those CEOs to be to, to value being more present in the media, yeah? building a personal brand. So you've seen Howard Schultz, an example of a CEO activist, the CEO of Starbucks. Uh, he is actually considered running for president. Yeah? So potentially one driver of CEO activism could be to build a personal brand or to get more attention. Then there's what I call, as a third reason for CEO activism, what I call moral reasons. So moral reasons or value-based reasons. They could be either related to the values of the company, what the company stands for, right? In the case of Patagonia, for example, it's very obvious the company stands for sustainability and it lives those values, or personal values of the CEO. So let me give you the example of, of Tim Cook again, right? Who has been one of the uh, very, you know, Few prominent, I mean, few of the prominent CEOs have publicly come out and said he's gay and spoken about his experiences as, as growing up as a, as a gay person, as being a gay manager, right? So it could be that the personal values of the CEO or values of the company are, um, are touched upon by the, the issue the CEO speak out upon. Or a moral reason could be that the CEO speaks out on behalf of other stakeholders, like on behalf of the employees. The fourth and final bracket I want to put in the categorize the drivers of CEO activism into is pressure, right? It could be that employees of a company push the company or the CEO to take a stance. It could also be pressure by society or by customers. An example is the employees of, of Google and Facebook who are right now engaging in quite, quite a lot of what we call employee activism, pushing the top management to take a stance on certain issues. That's so again, I would like to show you a little survey here. This is from KRC Research, it was also done in 2018. It's a bit different sample, but they asked respondents, what do you think is the reason why CEOs engage in CEO activism? And the colors of, of the survey and the colors of the different brackets I've put in here um, um, are aligned. So interestingly, most of the respondents um, think that the main driver of CEO activism for CEOs is to get attention in the news media or to build personal reputation. Yeah? Uh, strategic issues come in third and then last and second last. Yeah? So it seems interesting that the suspicion at least and that sample of respondents is that many CEOs engage in activism also to build up their personal brand. But please also note that many respondents also believe that there are moral reasons why the CEOs become involved. So moral reasons either because it touches upon the value of the individual or the values of the company. Now let's jump to the third part of my presentation here. Let's talk about the impact of CEO activism, right? Let's forget the drivers. 
let's talk about what is the effect of CEO activism. And this is a, a super exciting uh, line of research right now. Lots of team working on, on the issue, trying to figure out what is the impact of CEO activism on different stakeholders uh, and for companies and for managers. And to be frank, there's, there's a lot we don't know yet. So that makes us so super exciting. Let me introduce you to the first studies, which I think are just brilliantly done, and which can give us some insight on the impact of CEO activism. So let's start with the first one. Here the question is, what is the impact of CEO activism on public opinion? So can CEO activism change or move public opinion? And some scholars actually define CEO activism as having the purpose of moving public opinion on the issue in a certain direction. So there's a fantastic paper here by Ronnie Chatterjee and Mike Toffel, both from the US, who have done a huge survey uh, we call it a field or frame field experiment. They've basically run a survey with over 300,000 respondents here in the US. Right? And they presented the respondents with different frames of the very similar question and tried to understand whether or not the frame changes how respondents react. And the issue they have looked at is Indiana's Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Right? So this is an act which has been heavily disputed in the US as a law that has been passed uh, in Indiana in 2016 or 2015. And it basically allows businesses not to offer their services to certain customers if they think that those customers violate some religious uh, beliefs that business owners have. But the prime example, even though it wasn't in Indiana, is a gay couple who wanted to have a, a wedding cake for their wedding uh, and the bakery refused to bake the wedding cake for them based on their religion. Uh, okay, so this is basically just the issue was heavily debated in the US. They use that issue to see whether or not CEO activism can have and can move public opinion on an, on an issue. Here the issue of Indiana's Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So they gave them, they gave respondents three framings, okay? They simply asked, do you support this law? No other information. Do you support the law? Yes or no, or no opinion. Uh, then they gave them what we call treatment. So they gave them a little text which stated that Apple CEO's Tim Cook recently expressed his concern about Indiana's new law about religious freedom because he believes the law may allow discrimination against gays and lesbians in the state, right? So respondents who saw, so basically has been in the treatment section, they have seen that statement. And then there's been a control statement or a, another control section where they basically um, have the same text, but they don't mention uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook or any other politician. They just say some people said that this law might allow discrimination against gay and lesbians. Right? So if CEO activism can actually move public opinion on an issue, we should see that respondents react most strongly to the second and the third bracket here. So what are the results? So 50% of those who did not get any framing, just the question, do you support this law, um, to, uh, support the law, right? So 50%, and then you can see it's a contentious issue, right? 50% support it, and there's probably the rest is either against the law or no opinion. Of those who got the framing that Tim Cook speaks out against the law, 40% agreed with the law. So it's, it's less, it's 10% less already, but those who got the framing without making any specific reference to Tim Cook or any other CEO politician also only agreed to 40% with it. So one takeaway potentially is that CEO activism can move public opinion, right? But make not as strong as some who oppose CEO activism think it can. Now they've done another brilliant thing here. They have had also a question in there that they asked respondents before, namely whether or not they support or oppose the legalization of same-sex marriage in their state. Okay. And then they have divided respondents whether or not they support or oppose the legalization. And among those who support the legalization of same-sex marriage, not too surprising, only 14.3% uh, support Indiana's law. But if they've been treated with uh, Tim Cook's statement, this number decreases to exactly zero. And it decreases to 8.3%, still lower, if they just get some framing that some people think the law discriminates. But look at what happens among those who oppose same-sex marriage in the state. 92%, almost 92% um, support the Indiana's uh, new law. This number doesn't basically move if they get the information that uh, Tim Cook criticizes the law. 
but it moves quite significantly if they just get some information that some people criticize the law as maybe leading to discrimination against gays and lesbians. So the takeaway here is CO activism does have an impact on social political issues, um, but not as much as the supporters of it might think. And sometimes if, you're, if your goal is to move public opinion, it might be better to not personalize the activism, but maybe to speak out in concert. They did the same thing, the same experiment uh, on climate change and did not find any effect at all. So that might suggest that whether or not CO activism can move public opinion is very specific on the issue at hand. The Indiana's Religious Freedom Act, Restoration Act was rather a newer issue that came up, right, compared to at least climate change. So that might play a role here. Another role for the differences and, and the effects across the two issues might be that again, Tim Cook is, outspoke, is an outspoken on the issue of discrimination in general, but also with regards to gays and lesbians. Now, they've used the same experiment, now the authors here, to look at what is the effect on customers, and they looked at the intention to buy. So now we're going to switch the focus from can you move public opinion on an issue to does it have an effect on customers? Do customers buy your product, are more likely to buy your product um, when you engage in CEO activism or not? More or less same survey, slightly different questions. Simple question, are you going to likely buy Apple products in the future? Uh, this is the baseline, and then they've asked, okay, and then they've put an, um, um, a statement in here basically saying that Tim Cook opposes the uh, law in Indiana, and the third treatment or the second treatment here is basically that they've given, and that's the difference to the other um, um, experiment here, that they've asked, uh, they've said to participants that Tim Cook recently spoke about his management philosophy as being focused on people's strategy and execution. So no reference to, the, uh, to Indiana's law. Now, what is the effect on the activism on the intention to buy Apple products here? Uh, we see there's not much difference if we just look at the whole sample. Yeah? Um, it's a slightly higher for those who were, who were faced with Cook's discrimination uh, framing here, but the results are statistically almost indistinguishable. But what happens if we split it up again among those who oppose or support legalization of same-sex marriage in the state? And here we see that among those who support and see the difference to those who oppose same-sex marriage, right? So what is super interesting to see here is that among the respondents to actually oppose same-sex marriage, Tim Cook's statements made them less likely to buy Apple products. The difference is not gonna be uh, statistically significant, but they're gonna be more likely, and this difference is statistically significant, if they've just heard about Tim Cook's uh, approach to management, right? So this is extremely interesting here. It suggests right, that activism can affect customer purchase decisions, right? um, but it positively affects only customer purchase intention among those who agree with the CEO statement. And it potentially negatively affects us. Again, you know, we have to be careful here. The differences are not always statistically significant among those who disagree. But please remember, this is just the intention to purchase. Right? It's not the actual um, purchasing decision. Okay, let's quickly move on to the impact of CEO activism on employees. Another brilliant paper published this year in the Journal of Manage uh, in Management Science by Vanessa Babano from Columbia University. And she wanted to know what is the impact of CEO activism on employees, right? And again, it has been heavily suggested that employees are super important here when it comes to CEO activism. Now, what she has done is she has recruited workers in Upwork to do a little translation job. And she has run two experiments on those workers. In the first experiment, she simply asked them to do a translation and she has given them a survey to find their view on certain social political issues. And then she has picked an issue which, where the opinion was split 50-50 among the workers. And that was gender neutral bathroom. So female and male and so all people could use the same bathroom. That's basically what it is. Yeah. And then a month later, she contacted the same workers again, but through another company. So the workers didn't know it's gonna be the same company. And she asked them again, can you please do a translation job? And after they've done the translation job, she asked the workers, would you be willing to do some extra work? And so the question here is, are employees motivated to work more depending on what their stance on the issue of gender neutral bathrooms is and depending on what the stance of the company is towards gender neutral bathrooms. So workers can either support the issue, can be neutral or can oppose 
uh, um, gender neutral possible. And same for companies. They can either support the issue, oppose the issue, um, or have no opinion. Or no opinion is basically they don't speak about it. Now, among the workers who are neutral, right, we see that um, the workers, so if the workers are neutral, they don't have really an opinion, they're split between the two. Uh, but the company supports the issues. Workers are willing to do to translate 348 more words. This is roughly similar to the amount of words workers translate if they have not been uh, not faced any statement about gender neutral bathroom, just about that the company wants to change its name. Right? But we see a we see a decrease among those who actually uh, oppose the issue. So who are neutral, but the company opposes the issue. Now, this is basically just, you know, see it as a baseline. What becomes more interesting is to see in the brackets of workers opposing the issue and workers supporting the issue. So here, what we see, if you have a, a look at the, at the left bar here, the blue bar, this is the workers oppose the issue, so they don't want gender neutral bathrooms, but the company supports the issue. And what we see is a heavy decrease in the motivation to translate more words. We see a similar effect when the workers support the issue but the company um, opposes the issue. Again, we see that only 103 additional words are translated. Right? So a takeaway from that experiment here, and it's beautifully done, is basically there's an asymmetric effect on worker motivation of CEO activists. Those who agree with the company on, on, the, on, the, on a stance on an issue don't work more, but those who disagree with the stance of the company work less. Right? So, it doesn't seem to be as employees are unilaterally more motivated uh, or that the, the effect of CEO activism on employees is unilaterally positive. We have to be very, very careful. At least that experiment suggests that the effect could be rather negative on those who disagree with the company and not much of an effect for those workers who agree with the company. Now, of course, the, the magic question is, all, we know all the things about public opinion now. We know some information about uh, whether or not it affects customers' intention to buy a product. We have now some information about what the effect on employees is, but what's the overall effect on stock prices? So how does the stock market evaluate companies who CEO engages in CEO activism? And there's again a fantastic paper which just came out this year in the Journal of Management, which has looked at a couple hundred instances of CEO activism and found a negative abnormal return. So of minus 0.43%. Uh, so on average, companies engaging in our CEOs engaging in CEO activism, the companies experience a negative abnormal return of 0.43%. Right? If you think that's little, just multiply it by the revenues of, uh, of Apple or the, the market valuation of Apple, and that amounts to a few millions. Um, and they suggest that the negative effect is actually there because CEOs send a signal that engage in a CEO activism that they take care of social political issues instead of running the company. So that the attention of CEOs is towards social and political issues instead of running the company. Of course, they tell you they have a few moderators in here. I'm not going to go through them, but basically what they say is that the negative effect is going to be stronger the more the standpoint of the CEO deviates from the values of the customers, deviates from the values of the employees, deviates from the values of the government, and deviates from the brand image. And that's also what they find. Now, let me go to the last part here, and I'm going to go a bit quicker here so that we can open up for the Q&A. The what if. What if, if you are thinking about engaging in CEO activism, what if, if somebody you advise, maybe as a board member, and thinks about engaging in CEO activism? Now, one thing I want to make clear is using the classification of CEO activism I've introduced before is that going from token activism to strategic servant and to crit uh, citizen activism, the risk associated with that kind of activism increases almost linearly. So citizen activism is the type of activism we would usually perceive as having the highest risk. I'm gonna, what do I mean with risk? With risk, I mean potential backslash, potential calls to boycotts. Uh, you're running the risk of maybe alleviating 50% of the society, uh, or let's say 60-40 you know, issue, 40%. 40% of your customer, a large part of your employees. Maybe uh, you lineate the, the government of the country you're working in and so on. Yeah. So the risk of the activism for you of having some negative backlash increases from going from token to citizen um, activism. Now I'm gonna build on a different paper here by Smith and Korsher, who suggests that depending on 
whether or not the issue at hand is strongly or weakly related to your, your core of your business, or it's weakly or strongly related to the values of the companies, you should either maybe take a more neutral position or engage very forcefully in CEO activism. So the authors suggest that if the business relatedness is very weak and the company's values are not really um, um, in question here, you might take a neutral stance. Uh, you take a more pragmatic stance if the company's values are not really in, in question here, but the issue at hand has a strong uh, business relatedness. So that could be examples of the sustainability of an industry, for example. Uh, you take a more tempered approach when the values of the companies are uh, questioned here, but the business relatedness of the issue is not very salient. And you take a very forceful approach, a very vocal approach to activism if the business relatedness is strong and the relevance to the company's values is strong. So um, let me give you an example of how the risk of engaging in CEO activism can materialize. So you might remember or might not remember that picture here. It's obviously Australia who had huge wildfires all around the countries just before coronavirus started. So that used to dominate the news all around, uh, at least in Europe, that's what I experienced, right? Now, during those wildfires, um, the speaker or head, you could say, Lisa Neubauer of the Friday for Future movement in Germany started attacking uh, Joe Kaiser, the CEO of Siemens and Siemens, calling for strikes and boycotts uh, in front of the factories of Siemens and boycotts of Siemens products. Because they found out that Siemens is actually involved in building a coal mine somewhere in Australia. So leading to more deforestation in some areas. In fact, Siemens has been involved, but rather overall, you know, to a small extent. They actually just had a contract to provide the signal lights for the train track from the coal mine to the coast. But given that Joe Kaiser was very vocal before, he's spoken out on issues of sustainability, corporate social responsibility, immigration, racism. Um, he basically put his head out, right? Saying that Siemens wants to become the green energy of the company. He's standing for it with his values. He's been very vocal, vocally interfering in social political will formation processes. Uh, that almost became an easy target now for those who call them out for saying this is very, you know, this is cynical. On the one hand, you engage on those issues and push for more and stronger environmental laws. On the other hand, you engage in building a coal mine on Australia where half of Australia is on fire. So this is an example how that can actually backfire, right? So such CO activism backfires. You're putting your head out there, right? So be prepared that you're going to be, you know, your actions have to be consistent with what you're saying. Yeah. So if you engage a lot in, in activism on gender equality, but your company is not known for treating female employees well, for you know, maybe it's known for, for having a lot of diversity lawsuits, uh, maybe it's known for paying female employees less than male employees in similar positions, you might want to rethink if you want to put your head out on those issues. In my own research, uh, I found something similar. We call it the signal incongruence theory, right? What we have looked at is criticism in, in, in the public of CEOs compensation. And we've, what we found is when, uh, we, and that's what the signal incongruency here is, that CEOs who are perceived as being overpaid, so this is gonna be the example here on the right, CEOs are perceived as being overpaid by roughly 5 million. If the CEO works in a company that engages a lot in corporate philanthropy, that donates a lot to social and environmental causes, the CEO is gonna be more crit uh, criticized for the same amount of overcompensation than a CEO or the company, which engages less prominently in corporate philanthropy. And again, this is the idea of you putting your head out there. So if you engage in activism, right, um, you, you, you push your advocate for certain social political issues or standpoint on certain political issues, uh, just be sure that your, your whole business conduct, your personal behavior, but all of the conduct and the values of the companies are aligned. Because otherwise, you do trigger perceptions of hypocrisy, which are correctly so will be called on. Now, let me finish with the last slide before we open up the q and I'm just gonna be quick here. So if you're thinking about engaging in CEO activism, uh, you might wanna consider what is the reaction of important stakeholder groups to my position on the issue? What is the reaction of my customers, my employees, shareholders, or society? How many agree and disagree with my position? Huh? But it's not only important to know how many will agree and disagree with my position, it's also important to know how important is the issue for them. So you might have an issue where 30% of the population 
uh, is for a certain issue and 70% is against it. But those 30% who are for a certain issue have very, very strong opinions. And for them, the issue is the most important thing. Whereas for the 70% who are against the issue, that might not be the issue number one or two, it might be issue number 10. So in those cases, very likely you will get a rather weak reaction from those who support your standpoint, the 70%, but a strong reaction from those who oppose your reaction from the 30%. So the gun laws in the US are a prime example. The majority agrees that the gun laws should be stricter. It seems to be like a 60, 40, 30, 70 issue here. But those who are against stricter gun laws have very, very strong opinions on, on that issue. And it's a very important issue. Too. Also think about whether or not you want to be proactive or reactive. Do you want to be pushed to take a stance or you want to do it um, before you're being pushed? Do you want to act alone or in a coalition? So joining other CEOs, like the prime example I've given in the beginning. Do you want to act early when an issue comes up or rather later? Where do you speak up? Do you use Twitter, LinkedIn, do you use a press statement or the news media? Tweets are very short, can be misunderstood. Uh, press statements give you more opportunity to frame the issue. What do you cite as a reason for you for, for your activism? Is it business reasons or is it values or is it both? Is it personal values? Is it business values? Remember, personal values, depending on the issue, can trigger very strong reactions. In those cases, you might want to cite business reasons, saying, no, stronger immigration laws affect uh, the employees. I'm recruiting predominantly from uh, well-skilled workers here, so that's affecting my business goals. Um, think about, is the issue at hand? Are the values of your company at stake? Are your company's values at stake? If they are at stake, you might want to speak out. If they're not at stake, you might want to reconsider. Remember that take, not taking an option, uh, and, and not speaking out or not speaking out, uh, speaking out or not speaking out might sometimes not be an, uh, an option. Sometimes you might be pushed to speak out. And not speaking out might also be seen as taking a stance on an issue. And finally, please, you know, be respectful to the democratic will formation process. If you engage in CEO activism, you're probably likely speaking out on behalf of companies which are very powerful, very prominent, but potentially have the power to push uh, opinions in a certain direction. So be respectful of the democratic will formation process and of those who are democratically elected to speak on behalf of others. And with that, I would love to hear your questions. Uh, I've come up with you four topics here. We have defined what CEO activism is. We have spoken about what drives CEO activism. We have tried to learn a little bit about what the impact of CEO activism is. Again, we don't know that much yet. And the effects are a bit more, you know, more surprising than probably many of us thought, at least for me, that's the case. And I've given you some advice on whether or not, or when and how to engage in CEO activism. I would love to hear your questions and Anne will give me some, I hope. And thanks very much for your attention. Yes, uh, so Josh, thank you very much for your presentation. Indeed, the, the topic is, uh, there are many questions. So I also remind you that you can vote on the questions so that I, we make sure that we answer the ones that are of highest interest to most people. Um, maybe there's one to start with. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have to do with the really definition of this CEO activism. I know you started with that, but nevertheless, um, some people are asking, so is it about being able to uh, give interviews about it, posting on social media, uh, speaking up? Uh, is it some lobbying? So what is it exactly? And yeah. what is different today than what existed before? Yeah, so I mean, that's a great question, right? So is it just lobbying? Uh, and I would say, I mean, of course it's related, um, um, but it's not lobbying because CEO activism is very open, very prominent, uh, it's very vocal. So it's a CEO taking a public stance on a salient social political issue. Lobbying very often happens behind closed doors. In fact, companies very often don't want that they lobby for, on, on a certain issue. Yeah? So I would say it's very different from, from, uh, from lobbying. Um, and it's also, I think you, you said something about if it's related to corporate social responsibility here. I would say it's related, but it's not corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility is, is predominant often on issues where there's more an agreement among society. Whereas CEO activism is really on an issue that is currently hotly debated in a country. Uh, it's super current and where opinion is very often split. So you could take the example of the, the I mean, I know it's a, it's a bit 
we take it too often, but of the last election in the U.S., whether or not Donald Trump now accept uh, accept the uh, that he has lost potentially lost uh, the, the presidency here or not, right? So now it's, it's a huge push uh, of CEOs to take a stance and to say, okay, you know, let's accept uh, the results of the election or let's not accept the results of the election. So this is different from CSR, right? This is something that is hotly debated right now, where the opinions are, you know, really split 40, 60, 50, 50. And there's very strong arguments being made on both sides, often not super rational arguments, right? Very often it's, it's certain norms, ethics, viewpoints, religious viewpoints, political viewpoints are being attached. There's low information content in those discussions here. So I would argue it's different from CSR. And one character which really differentiates it from lobbying and CSR is said that CEO activism is an act of communication, is speaking out. It might be followed by some action, but the act itself is, is not usually associated with some investment like CSR would be in those cases. So, and I hope that answers the question, but. <laughs> yes. I, I'm sure it does. Um, there are a couple of other questions that have to do with the risk of being uh, an activist as a CEO. And uh, basically, there are questions that ask whether uh, it's been measured, like how much can you lose customers versus how much can you attract customers? Um, do you have examples of uh, CEO being fired for their activism? And um, is the risk linked to specific issues? So there's the ones that ask, are there specific issues of activism that are more at risk for CEOs? Yeah. Uh, so it's very tough to, to, to associate, you know, the firing of a CEO to a certain reason. So usually it's, it's multiple things and usually CEO is not fired, but, you know, takes care of family businesses or something like this. Um, but I, it's, it's definitely more risky on the type you speak out upon. So again, I would use that, that, uh, Two by two matrix I've shown you there, it becomes way more riskier if the relation to your business is lower, and but the the issue at stake is very hotly debated here. Yeah? Um, it becomes it becomes more risky to, for backfire if, for example, you cite more value based reasons than business reasons. So it seems right, and and take it with a, a, a grain of salt here, salt of grain, grain of salt, um, that. You know, when businesses cite, speak out and say, this is hurting our business or this is hurting our potential to recruit the best employees or something like this, it is usually viewed more favorably than activism, which is on behalf of personal stances of, of the CEO. So um, I would, you know, and, and remember the, the surveys I've shown you in the beginning where the majority or at least larger part of the survey respondents were negatively towards CEO activism the CEO activism was not related to the business, but on behalf of personal values. And from the CEO's perspective, of course, it needs to be somehow credible as well, right? So in, in terms of Tim Cook's uh, example, it's very credible that he speaks out against laws on you know, expressing his viewpoint. Uh, he's, he's based on his own values, it's based on his experiences. Uh, in other circumstances, it might be less credible. Right? And then the potential that, that such activism might backfire is rather large. So if CEO of a big oil company speaks out on behalf of higher environmental protection, that likely is going to backfire more strongly than if Tim Cook speaks out against uh, laws which he perceives as discriminating against a lesbian and gays in the state. Uh, thank you very much, George. Maybe a last question just to, uh, to wrap it up. Uh, there are a couple of questions about is there um, any insight about why CEOs choose to engage in CEO activism or choose not to? And then a very related question, which is, has it become an expectation for CEOs to actually have opinions, voice them, and engage in activism? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Sarah. So the little we know about it um, is very often that CEOs cite their own values. So they're saying this is an issue which is which is dear to their heart. Either again, the, the example from Tip Cook or Emmanuel Faber, who says like sustainability, changing capitalism is dear to their heart. Um, this is one bracket where we put it in. Uh, the other bracket is strategic considerations, right? Either building the personal brand of the CEO or increasing the business performance of of the company. Now, empirically, it's very hard, and so far we haven't really been able to do it to distinguish the beam uh, the, between different reasons, right? 
Um, of course, we could ask CEOs if they speak to us, they might not tell us the truth, or it might be the truth, and we don't know if they tell us the truth or not. Um, so that, to get the motivations of, of, of actors, why they engage is very, very difficult. But many CEOs in interviews cite that this is an issue where they, where they feel that their personal values are at stake, or where they have to speak out also on behalf of, of people who don't have the possibility in the same prominence to move the issue here, right? Which does not say there might also be strategic reasons. Yeah. Um, is it an expectation that CEOs speak out on certain issues? It seems as it becomes more and more an expectation. Uh, let's see if there's going to be some pushback. I know that some stakeholder group, uh, some some shareholder groups are already pushing back. Uh, but it seems, at least in some industries, uh, that, that em employees, especially um, Silicon Valley, push CEOs a lot to take a stance on certain issues. We also see that customer groups and consumer groups push CEOs to take a stand. Uh, we've seen before the last election that a number of over a thousand business professors in the US have pushed CEOs to take a stand on, on the election. So it's likely that the pressure will continue to grow. Now, the, the tricky question is, of course, we have seen a lot of activism or new cases of activism, the rise of activism with the election of Donald Trump as a president. He's been very divisive, divisive on many issues. Now, assuming he's not the president of the United States anymore with a new president, will we see less activism here? Will the pressure for CEOs to speak out be less? And I'm not really sure that is going to be the case. So the New York Times just ran an article on it two days ago. The prediction is likely since it's going to be a Democratic president, Joe Biden, and it's going to be a likely Republican controlled Senate that CEOs will continue to speak out, uh, engage in CEO activism but likely maybe more on what we call the traditional issues here. So issues re related more to the core of their business, sustainability, transforming an industry, and less so on issues which have rather little relation to their business, but have high you know, contentiousness as an issue in society. Thank you very much, George. Thank you all for joining this session. Thank you very much, George, for sharing your insights about these important topics today. And uh, well, I wish you all a good day or evening, wherever you are, and uh, hope to see you soon for our other webinars. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>